Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 308, featuring an interview with Anthony and Nicola Caulfield, the producers of this documentary, From Bedrooms to Billions. Now this is a, a documentary about the British side of the games industry. It's fascinating stuff, lots of stories I hadn't heard before, and uh, tons and tons of great interviews. I really enjoyed it. Wanted to get them on to talk about it. And they'll also uh, talk about their upcoming documentary called The Amiga Years. A lot of great stuff to cover here, so without further ado, here is Anthony and Nicola Caulfield. All right, folks, I am here today with Anthony and Nicola uh, Caulfield, the husband and wife team behind the documentary From Bedrooms to Billions, which I happen to have a copy of right here. Really nice uh, cover on this. Now, this covers the uh, British side of the video game industry throughout, I'd say, the eight before and up to the, I guess, everything up to the 16-bit era. Does that sound slightly bit, goes actually it actually goes all the way through to the to the present day. It speeds up a little bit through the 16-bit era. Um, there's a reason for that. And oh, the uh, film would have been about 10 hours long. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, so you're in the process of making a, uh, another one, right, about the Amiga years. So That's right. That's right. It's, That's kind of where this the, the, the idea of the Amiga years is where in from bedrooms where we couldn't go into depth on the 16-bit. That's where we've kind of picked up from and gone off on that. That tangent for us, isn't it? That's right. The, the, the first, uh, and I think the other thing about um, the first film um, talks about the, from our point of view, you see, what we, um, we, we grew up through the 1980s um, and we experienced, like many other children um, across the UK growing up from the late 70s and through the 80s, the, the, the computer revolution, the microchip revolution, all of it. And as somebody actually said while we were making the film, it was, it was for us, it was our rock and roll. You know, you tend to find the baby boomers born in the 1940s and early 50s will talk about rock and roll through the late 50s and 60s and say, you know, it was our rock and roll. Well, the the video game revolution was our rock and roll. It was it was a it, and it wasn't. We felt from a UK perspective, it wasn't being um, recognised in any way. And a huge, you know, we're talking millions of children across the UK during the 1980s were were playing, consuming, writing games, and contributing to the industry. And by the the late 1990s. We didn't see we um, when Nicola and I actually started making, actually working in this industry. Um, certainly not doing what we do now, but I mean getting in at a sort of the lowest rung. Mm. Uh, one of the things we talked about was we'd love well, whatever happened to some of those British companies and British developers, and and um, so eventually, many years later, when we when we had the opportunity, we started to research where the British industry came from. So we we're only looking at it from a British perspective. Um, and it was it took a lot of work because nobody actually really knew. Everybody had a different opinion. No one had written a book about it before. There were some magazines like Retro Gamer, but they they do sort of obviously articles that are sort of spread out. Um, whereas no one had actually tried to bring all the story together. Um, so the reason that the film has got nearly a hundred interviews in it is simply because we had to continually keep shooting and shooting and shooting until we found out exactly how it came about and also what happened to it because it seemed to go through a nosedive um, in the early 1990s. A lot of people lost their jobs and all sorts of other things and the industry in the UK melted down. Whereas with the, the Amiga years, the film we're working on at the moment, we've opened it up so we are just covering how the, how the Commodore Amiga, how it changed. It created one of those major chapters in this, in this 40 year story of the video games industry and we're talking the whole video games industry in this instance, the Amiga is a major part of that story. So we thought, well, for this, the follow-up, we can't just do from a UK perspective, it just be a complete waste. So for the Amiga years, it's, it's basically, it's global. It's global. Yeah. Well, as global as we can be, because obviously with the greatest respect to the Japanese, who, let's be honest, have certainly contributed a lot to the worldwide games industry, the Amiga is not something necessarily that they had a major um, grip on in that respect. It was very much US and, and Europe. So um, and with some other countries dotted about as well before anybody starts sort of tearing their hair out saying what about the Aussies and, and everything else. Yes. But the, the, the point is is that we thought well we can't ignore other developers all over the world. So if we're going to do it we need to interview everybody uh, or certainly as many people as we can. Yeah. And that's what we that's what we've been doing. 
I'm gonna stop and have a sip of coffee now. Yeah, I mean the Jap. Uh, to me, the Japanese guys. They've got. I mean, they've gotten lots of coverage, right? I mean, they're well known. It's the Amiga that nobody's heard of. You know, at least. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm glad that you're covering that. Now, I'll just say, you know, I've seen this this documentary. You know, anybody that watches uh, Match at this show, I, you know, I can't rec. It's no brainer. You know, go. <laughs> Uh, go watch this. You know, I, I wonder if you uh, have any favorites from a favorite guests or favorite interviewees. I really liked uh, the uh, uh, John Hare's part on here. Yeah. Uh, I liked, uh, well, Matthew Smith was pretty interesting. I think you had Rob Hubbard on here, Jeff That's Minter. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, I kind of lost track after a while, but it seems like everybody <laughs> I've ever heard of is on here, <laughs> or at least gets mentioned. Oh, that's a tough question. I think I think Matthew yeah. Smith was um that was, that was good. It has yeah. to be a favorite. Jet Set Willie and Manic Miner. Yeah, and it also oh. took a year to get him. It genuinely took from about January January 2012 until December 2012. I remember yeah. it took a year of of and, um, and going through other people yeah. as well, wasn't it? I got to say he looked like he was in pretty bad shape. I don't know what is, uh, is he has has a medical condition or what's what's going on with him? Um, I think probably the easiest way to sum it up is life. Mm. Sometimes, sometimes life and certain people just they just have a rougher time. And I think the problem. I think the the as as it's said in the film itself, um, he had a huge amount of success and money come to him at a very early age, at the age of sixteen. And let's not forget that he, he was creating games before Jet Set Willy, certainly with Manic Miner. He was creating games simply for fun. So no, you know, it wasn't necessarily commercial gain. He was doing it because it was fun. And as soon as it didn't become fun and it became, there was pressure to deliver Jet Set Willy. A follow Manic Miner is a huge hit. You need, to develop, you need to do a follow up. And there was publishers involved. And we're not criticizing the publishers because they were doing what they were trying to do best, which is get a product and get it out and make as much money as possible for it. And Matt was going to share in that, so we're not saying that he was being sort of screwed over or anything, but he started to buckle under the pressure of, of Jet Set Willy. And the game effectively was released effectively unfinished. There was some quite severe bugs in it. Uh, it was still playable, but technically it was it had some had some major problems, which Matt, Matt knows about. Um, and then it, it just fell apart from there. So he found talking about Jet Set Willy extremely difficult because Jet Set Willy is where it started to go wrong for him. Whereas Manic Miner, uh, it was a great experience for him. So I think that when we did his interview, the interview lasted nearly three hours because we got his entire life story. Mm. But we had to be extremely delicate with how we actually edited it in the film. because And, and funny enough, Matt was not the only person that actually... Um, uh, got extremely emotional on camera because if you think about it an awful lot of certainly from the British games industry's point of view there was a lot of children that that found success early there's a lot of 15 year olds 16 year olds that that uh, simply wrote games for the fun of it because these early microcomputers Commodore 64 ZX Spectrum Oryx all these by today's standards primitive boxes effectively they were we were trying to understand what the obsession was, why they wanted to work on them so badly. And I mean, we I used to sit and do type in listings. Nicola used to yes. before All years day, be years so before we ever met. You yeah. know, so so we were just as sad. But it, mm. but what we were trying to understand what the passion was, where it came from, and 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 what drove these children. And of course, when these some of these children got success early, some of them adapted very well and have gone on to forge multi-million dollar businesses. Others. They maybe just had the one hit, and then it just didn't materialize after that. And for others, they broke under the pressure. So we were coming across all these stories because effectively, there there's people's lives. Um, I mean, I mean, we there was quite a few people that hadn't talked about it for, for years. You know what they'd gone through. So we'd go there and sit with them, spend you know, two, three hours, yeah. and it would just be. On, you know, getting everything off their chest about the whole thing, and like Anthony said, it did start off with a lot of them like it was fun, very cottage industry, and then as that grew, I think a lot of quite a few of them found it really difficult mm. to adjust to that whole business side. So, you know, it's great making the games, but then having to adapt to that business side as well. Yeah, dude, there's a lot of similarities to the early days of rock and roll, maybe even the modern. Yeah. Uh, 
The th- you know, the Matt Smith thing to me that that part of the documentary really sort of punched me in, in the in the heart when I saw that because you had the pictures of him before during the Manic Miner. It looks like a very happy go lucky, cheerful guy. And you, you play those games, and you just kind of imagine, well, whoever made this must be you know, extremely cheerful and, and kind of a silly guy. And then you see those sort of modern, like here he is today, and you're like, wow, man, this yeah. is, yeah, I don't know, it's it, it really kind of got to me, that that, that whole that whole segment. Yeah. I, I think as well, we when we spent the day with him, um, as he started talking, that sadness was there. But then as it went on, and I think he got more and more comfortable with us, that side of him did come out, didn't it? The silly side, the fun side. We did start to see that as well. The funniest thing for me was that we, um, to put him at ease, we said to him that where would he feel most comfortable doing the interview because he, uh, he, he, he lives with his, his mother looks after him basically. Don't get me wrong, he's not, he's, he's quite lucid and, and you know, and everything else but he's, uh, he's got a great relationship with his mum. His mum looks out for him and, you know, and he, you know, he's got a good, a good um, home life in that respect but she didn't want any filming at the house and she didn't want really anything to remind her of those video game early uh, video game days because that's a period that her, her her son you know so we could understand that so we what we said was was there somewhere that he would feel at ease so he just said oh the old video arcade that I used to go to back in the early eight, 1980s so we thought oh, it's never going to be there you know there now so when did you last go to it Matt and he's you know uh, 30 yeah, years, did, 30 so. years ago, is it? Oh, okay. So, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's in Liverpool. So we act by such a complete miracle. The place is still there, um, and the guy that runs it um, is now in his late sixties and used to actually be there when he was like a teenager because his dad used to run it. So he was actually the same guy behind the counter 30 years ago when Matt used to come in. So I rang wow. him up and just said, "We've got Matt Smith." Thinking, because I'm thinking from a video game world that everybody, you know, a lot, most people know who Matt Smith, Matthew Smith is. So this guy said, "Yeah, I can't wait. Fantastic, bring him in. I'll shut the shut the place for you. Amazing." So we brought him in, and he thought he was going to meet Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. <laughs> so, yeah, but he did close the place, and we got a we got a wonderful interview. But the funny thing is about that particular segment in the film. Growing up. Um, in the 1980s and reading the video game magazines that we had, computer and video games over here, Zap 64 for the Commodore 64 fans, Crash for the Spectrum, and there were many, many other magazines as well. But they did, because so many of those those um, games developers were actually uh, effectively one person, one single person, they used to um, effectively make them appear to almost be like superstars. So you'd have, you started to hear these names, the like Archer McLean, Jeff Crammond, Andrew Braybrook, all these names were being used all the time in the magazine. So as a kid reading this, you start to sort of idolize them and they become superstars. So there were these actual true stories of, of these large exhibitions like the Personal Computer World Show Olympia, which is a massive, massive great show, mm-hmm. of these programmers turning up, you know, and that's, they are just a programmer who basically mm-hmm. spends most of their time in a dark room with a computer and a huge line of kids were holding cassette tapes or discs wanting their, their game signed. And See, that's a huge difference there between the the UK or the British industry, side of the industry in, in America. You know, because I did, growing up, I was just as much into games as anybody and I couldn't name a single designer or developer, anybody anybody by name. You know, it's come much, much later, but it seems like... that. You know, looking at those mag, you know, you had the shots of the magazines throughout the the documentary, yeah. and it really seemed like, you know, we keep coming back to this music scene and the rock scene, but it really se- seemed more like the sort of rock and roll magazine would have all the pictures of the performers on it and everything. You know, how do you account for that discrepancy? That's very very interesting because we've actually talked about while we've been making the Amiga years, we've actually been talking to a lot of U.S. developers, and what and just just for the hell of it, um, we've actually been asking them the same sorts of early questions that we asked a lot of British developers while making From Bedrooms to Billions to try and understand that. And what we found was that it seemed to be that the the, the early US industry, bearing in mind we haven't done all our research yet, so, uh, you know, I, we, I am, we could be wrong. I am <laughs> prepared, we are prepared to be completely wrong, yeah. so we are still collating is probably the, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the word, but it seemed to be that it was far more fragmented and um, and even more certainly when you take companies like um, like the Carver brothers 
who were doing, you know, Beachhead and, and that sort of thing, they actually, as you noticed, there was that clip in the film where a British distributor went over to the US from the UK and it was a very fledgling industry in the UK, but it actually seemed to be more of an industry in the UK at that point, went to the US and the, the, the Carver brothers were shocked that actually there was anybody else in the entire world playing computer games because it there wasn't an internet in that respect then so they were just selling mangas they were selling games in magazines so the, the mail order industry in the in the US was even more popular but still very small when when compared to the population um, of but, the but US also I think in this country and I could be completely wrong but the magazines that we had really did hone in on different on more the people as opposed, I think, to the game. They wanted to know who was behind that game, and they'd be, they'd have all these video, di uh, all these diaries, not not video diaries, all these diaries in the magazines, talking about and getting them to write how they developed that game. So, I think our magazines really yeah, pushed that. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually. I don't. And I, so that's how I think. And you know, and also a lot of the um, exhibitions that we had here, they were very, very small just little tabletop um, affairs where people could turn up and meet them people and I think it was just very intimate if you like as to as to, with the people I think it was all about the people here I, I can't say so much for America would, would you say that it was mostly focused on on the city of London yeah it, yeah. it was it was London the north Liverpool it was more than north it was actually you would actually be doing yeah. a disservice to say that yeah. it was actually less development going on in London mm. than anywhere else in the country, predominantly wanted to try and understand why it seemed to be that it was going on up north. And do you know what? I have to be very careful when I say this because this is what we were told. It, we were told that they just um, we'd ask all these northern developers, why do you think so much more development was going on up north than say down down south in London? And they'd say because there's too much excitement down in London. That's their words, not mine. We heard that a lot where they said that there's just not enough to do up north, so we would sit and play our computers now I'm you know that was yeah. quite a few that's people said our, that whatever, and I'm not yeah, saying that's, that's our right. opinion yeah. we didn't put it in the film because it just didn't seem to be that relevant yeah. at the end of the day it was a it was a thriving it industry was in, across the, the, UK. in the major cities yeah, across, yeah. So well you had Man Manchester, Manchester Birmingham, Liverpool, Leeds, Sheffield, Hull, Hull. <laughs> yeah Hull <laughs> but I do think it was also the um the, the trade shows that grew and grew and grew I mean, you obviously in the US you had the exhibitions as well, but I think I think there's that there's also that island mentality. You know, the UK when you compare it to the US is very small, um, and there is that sort of. Uh, and also, I think as Nicola said, um, it's interesting actually because we've not really sort of processed it. We've not really thought about it in the way that because you were asking us these questions, it's made us sort of um, it sort of challenged us a little bit, which is great. And I think that the I think that we. From what we're aware of, you didn't have the same sort of magazine um, that, or, or a, such a large number of magazines aimed at children. Uh, game that, that well, it was uh, like your zaps and crap. We had a huge like number that. of magazines that were selling, I mean, hundreds of thousands of issues a month. So what was happening was you were finding that if you got yourself a Commodore 64, um, you're finding that a lot of people in the, in the school playground had Commodores or they had the Spectrum or whatever. So you tended to group group with those um, and then you go and buy a magazine about the Commodore and that was written for, ch it was written almost by children for children so it might be sort of teenagers writing it with that sort of kiddie also, mentality then, you know that slightly risky sort yeah. of humour which in itself fueled the industry as well and really sort of focused all the energy in and, it. and those then, then like the Commodore and the Spectrum there was yeah. all this rivalry in the playground as well so I think that we just really embraced that and Maybe that's the reason. It's a, it's a true subculture, sounds like. And it was very much a cottage industry. And then, obviously, as the industry grew, that was another challenge, is that as um, people had to try and get their product out of, of England and get over to America and that. And I think that was another challenge as well. And bringing American products over yeah. to the UK, because obviously US Gold, that was a major, um, the centre soft group, <coughs> going to the US and buying up some of the US, some fantastic, stunning US games. Um, and uh, which weren't selling that well in the US. I mean, give an example, Jim Sachs, um, the artist from Defender of the Crown. Now, um, amazing story. Um, you know, we interviewed him a couple of weeks ago for the Amiga years. You know, effectively, he was in the, he, he was in the US uh, Air Force flying um, huge, great cargo planes 
for years, leads the um, the Air Force, and then buys a Commodore 64. You know, it's almost like the two things don't. And, and with the greatest respect to Jim, he was more. He wasn't a, a kid. He was more mature. You know, he was in his in his um, in his uh, early thirties by that point, and then he just suddenly decided that he wanted to start programming. But there was no and 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 creating. And the easiest thing to do would be to create a game. So it's quite a logical progression if you think about it. You want to learn to program, and you see an arcade game or something like that. You're going to try and to learn to program. You're going to try and replicate that game. Mm. So often you tend to find that so many. Um, developer's first game is is an arcade imitation, simply because it, it's easier to learn. Oh, okay, well, I'll copy that sprite and I'll, I'll copy this and I'll get that right. And then by the end of it, you've you've learned a lot of the fundamental basics of how to program. And then your next couple of games are going to be original IP, original ideas. So we tended to find a lot of developers their first game would be some form of rip off, which they would know, you know, that to try and to try and learn that. And Jim Sachs was telling us that when he came up with this sort of basic shoot 'em up thing, um, once he'd done it, he had nowhere to sell it. Because there wasn't any sort of, there was no retail for games in the US, just like in the UK at the very beginning, there was no retail industry. There were isolated computer shops throughout the US. So literally, he'd run off 50 cassette tapes, and he'd put them in a suitcase, get in a car, and he'd drive around the computer shops in the US, selling them out of a suitcase. This is the artist that went on to do Defender of the Crown and, you know, be this esteemed, a pioneering, um, pioneering cool. artist. But that story is quite similar. There was, a, there was a, quite a few US developers that were doing the same. And then on the other side of the pond, that was going on in the UK. So it's, it's, I think all of it comes down to the, we were trying to understand what was the driving force? What was the motivating force? Because there was no industry. So we've actually... And I think it, it was just fun, though. And we have thought about going back and for a future project telling the same story in the US. And we'd need to interview a lot of people and we'd need to really understand how the industry got going. Because we are talking about the biggest entertainment industry on the planet Earth now. Mm. And it's, it's wonderful to start you know, documenting its roots and understanding where it came from and what drove it and, and how little commercial thinking there was. How, but, um, not including Atari in that, because if you take Nolan Bushnell, for example right from the start, I'm building a piece of hardware to make money. So there was commercial... That's where it all started, yeah. to, go wrong, right? That's where it all started <laughs> to go wrong, right there. And that's all for this week's episode. Hopefully we'll see you guys next week. I will... Uh, I uh, might have to wait another two weeks to get the second installment. I'm going to try my best to have it ready for you uh, before then, but I have to go out of town this weekend. I don't know what uh, what my schedule will be like, so if you don't, again, I'm sorry to do this, but if you don't hear hear from me, uh, just uh, sit tight. It will be I'll, I'll get the next episode as soon as possible. As always, I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your support of the show. Uh, really means a great deal to me. I just can't thank you enough for that. Uh, if you would like to support the show yourself, uh, remember, any amount is fine, $1, $5, or whatever you can uh, afford, and you think the show is worth, just go to the Patreon link in the show notes and set up your subscription. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Well, the biggest news, I guess, is personal uh, for me, is a, I finally finished the manuscript of Vintage Games 2.0. Now, this is almost a complete rewrite of the book, so if you already have the first one, uh, you're going to want the second one, too, because you know, it's completely different. It's got uh, 50 games in there. It's got pictures, screenshots, photos, uh, stories about how these games came to be. Uh, just really, really uh, awesome stuff. I know you guys will, will enjoy that. Uh, now, some of you have supported the show up to a certain level, and you'll be getting the uh, a free copy of that. Uh, but everyone else, I will have uh, updates, you know, as I get them about when this when we can expect to see this thing on the shelves and so on. But anyway, I'm really excited about this, really proud of it, and I wanted to share it with you. All right, what about some uh, other news here? I've got uh, Shane Stacks, a friend of mine, friend of the show. He, uh, I thought you guys would be interested... He uh, interviewed Chris Avalon and got him on there talking about Numenera, 
on his uh, Shane Plays uh, podcast. I'll put a link to that on the show notes for you. And then Adam uh, interviewed Trent Oster of Beamdog uh, talking about Baldur's Gate uh, Dragon Spear. And he's also uh, interviewed Becky, uh, Becky Berger Heinemann. Uh, so I know you guys will be interested in those. And I'll have uh, links to Adam Adam's show as well. Uh, anyway, lots of awesome stuff. So maybe that can tide you over until I get back. All right. What about that ale of the week? I get a little dry. I could use this. Uh, we have here a Black O Lantern Pumpkin Stout, brewed with pumpkin and spices out of Wasatch Brewery out of Utah. <laughs> little story here. Alone in his laboratory one stormy night, a madman crossed an imperial stout with pumpkin to create this Franken brew. <laughs> How good is it? Well, scary good. <laughs> oh, man. Food pairings. Eye of Newt. Devil's Food Cakes. So th these guys had a lot of fun with that. Uh, let's see, any other information? Misbehaving in Utah, apparently it's unfiltered. Uh, let's see. Alcohol, 6.5% by volume, so uh, not bad, not too strong, but uh, not too weak either. Not something you'd want to uh, chug, probably. Anyway, let's get this uh, Black O'Lantern open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Black O'Lantern pumpkin stout here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I just, I really love the bottle on this. Really cool. I love that. Ah, smells really good. You definitely smell the pumpkin in here. I smell the hops as well. It just smells really, really good. Really looking forward to this. So uh, let's give it a taste. <clears throat> it's kind of a... You definitely taste that sort of black stout-like uh, flavor. Uh, that's that's very pronounced. Uh, the pumpkin, not really tasting. I smell a lot of pumpkin. I'm not really tasting a lot of pumpkin. I'll, let me try it again, though. Now you can just you can sort of taste the pumpkin in the aftertaste, but really what I'm um, tasting a lot is that sort of uh, sort of cherry-like, uh, scotch-like flavor that you get with those really strong uh, stouts. Yeah, you know, it tastes like it's got more than 6.5, but I'll you know, adjust their judgment on that. You know, you know, it's not bad. Uh, I don't think this has anything on my uh, favorite pumpkin ale, which is pumpkin. Uh, but you know, again, it's not bad. Pumpkin stout. You know, it's, it's somewhat, somewhat a different take, I guess, on the pumpkins. I haven't really tasted this a particular combination before. Let me just try to try it one more time here. You know, what I'm really tasting, it's kind of a smoky flavor. Like I say, the, those cherries and scotch. Uh, you can taste some of the hops in this. It's uh, a little bit bitter, and the pumpkin is uh, a little subtle. I'd like a little bit more pumpkin flavor, maybe a little bit less of the uh, uh, the other flavors, but, you know, your mileage may, may vary with that. I'm going to go uh, three out of five drinking horns on this. Again, not bad. Uh, nothing uh, wrong with this. You might actually prefer this. Uh, when I go for a pumpkin ale, though, I want something with a... Bit more pumpkin, a little bit sweeter tasting. So, uh, three out of five drinking horns on the uh, Black O' Lantern. So let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking for quotations by Sir Clive Sinclair, and I found this. Uh, it's really kind of more dialogue, I guess, than a, than a quote. But they were talking to him. This is back in 1982 uh, about the future of computers and sort of where he thought things were going and that that sort of thing. And uh, here's what he had to say. We have to be careful that you do not remove the rituals of things, like shopping or banking. Sometimes it is possible for something to disappear before people realize that it is what they want to keep. I'll see you guys next week. Yeah, and then we looked at each other and said, so well, we might as not. well join up, you know. And, uh, so we became uh, the originals, right. and uh, we had to change our name, actually. Well, there's, a, there's another group in the East End called the Originals, and uh, we had to rename ourselves. And the New Originals. New Originals, yeah. and then uh, they became the Regulars. They changed their name back to the Regulars, and we thought, well, we could, we could go back to the Originals, but what's the point?